The following is a conversation with Peter Woit, a theoretical physicist at Columbia, outspoken critic of string theory, and the author of the popular physics and mathematics blog called Not Even Wrong. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, here's my conversation with Peter Woit. You're both a physicist and a mathematician. So let me ask, what is the difference between physics and mathematics? Well, there's kind of a conventional understanding of the subject that they're two, you know, quite different things. So that mathematics is about, you know, making rigorous statements about these abstract, you know, abstract things, things of mathematics and, and pro proving them rigorously. And physics is about, you know, doing experiments and testing various models and that. But it, I think the more interesting thing is that the, there's a you know, there's a wide variety of what people do as mathematics, what they do as physics, and there's a significant overlap, and that I, I think is actually the much much very very interesting area. And if you go back kind of far enough to in 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 history and look at figures like Newton or something, I mean, there it, at that point you can't really tell you know was Newton a physicist or a mathematician. The uh, mathematicians will tell you he's a mathematician, the physicists will tell you he's a physicist, but he, he will say he's a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that's interesting. But uh, yeah, anyway, there 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 was kind of no such distinction then. It's more of a modern thing. And but anyway, I think these days there's a very interesting space in between the two. So in the story of the 20th century and the early 21st century, what is the overlap between mathematics and physics? Would you say? Well, I think it's actually become very very complicated. I think it's really interesting to see a lot of what my colleagues in the math department are doing. They most of what they're doing, they're doing all sorts of different things, but um, most of them have some kind of overlap with physics or other. Um, so, I mean, I'm personally interested in, in one specific, one particular aspect of this overlap, which I think has a lot to do with the most fundamental ideas about physics and about mathematics. But um, there's just it, it, you you kind of see this this uh, really really everywhere at, at this point. Which particular overlap are you looking at? Group theory. Yeah. So the um, at least. What, the way it seems to me that if you look at physics and look at the our most successful um, laws of fundamental physics, they're really you know they have a certain kind of mathematical structure. It's based upon certain kind of mathematical objects and geometry, and connections and curvature, the spinners, the Dirac equation, and uh, that these this very deep mathematics provides kind of a unifying set of math of ways of thinking that allow you to to, to make a unified theory of physics. But the interesting thing is that if you go to mathematics and, and look at what's been going on in mathematics the last 50, 100 years, and even especially recently, there's a similarly some kind of unifying ideas which bring together different areas of mathematics, and which have been especially powerful in number theory recently. And there's a book, for instance, by um, Edward Frankel about love and math. And oh, yeah, that book's yeah, great. I yeah, recommend it highly. It's yeah. uh, partially accessible. But there's a nice audio book uh, that I listened to while running an exceptionally long distance, uh, like across the uh, San Francisco uh, bridge. And uh, there's something magic about the way he writes about it. But s some of the group theory in there is a little bit difficult. Uh, yeah, it's a problem with with any of these things to kind of really say what's going on and is and make it accessible is very hard. He in this book and elsewhere, I think, you know, takes the attitude that kinds of mathematics he's interested in and that he's talking about are provide kind of a grand unified theory of mathematics. They um they bring together geometry and number theory and representation theory, a lot of different ideas in, in a really uh, unexpected way. But I think to, to me the most fascinating thing is if you look at the kind of grand unified theory of mathematics he's talking about and you look at the physicist's kind of ideas about unification, it's more or less the same mathematical objects are appearing in both. So it's this, um, I think there's a really, we're seeing a really strong indication that, you know, the deepest ideas that we're discovering about physics and some of the deepest ideas that mathematicians are learning about are really, are, you know, intimately connected. Is there something, like, if I was five years old and you were trying to explain this to me, <laughs> is there ways to try to sneak up to this, to, to what this unified world of mathematics looks like? You said number theory, you said geometry, words like topology, what does this universe begin to look like? Are these, what should we imagine in our mind? Is it a, 
a three-dimensional surface and we're <laughs> trying to say something about it? Is it uh, triangles and squares and cubes? Like what, what are we supposed to imagine in our minds? Is this natural number? What, what's a good thing to try to, for people that don't know any of these tools, except maybe some basic calculus and geometry from high school that they should keep in their minds as to the unified world of mathematics that also allows us to explore the unified world of physics. The, I mean, what, what I find kind of remarkable about this is the way in which these, we've discovered these ideas, but they're, they're actually quite alien to our everyday understanding. You know, we grow up in this three spatial dimensional world and we have intimate understanding of certain kinds of geometry and certain kinds of things. But, um, these things that we've discovered in both math and physics are that they're not at all close have any obvious connection to kind of human everyday experience that they're they're really quite different and i can say some of my initial fascination with this when i was uh, young and starting to learn about it was actually exactly this um this kind of arcane nature of these things it was a little bit like being being told well there are these kind of semi mystical experience that you can acquire by you know long study and whatever except that it, that it was actually true. I mean, there's actually evidence that this actually works. So, you know, I'm a, a little bit wary of, of trying to give people that kind of thing because I think it's mostly misleading. But one thing to say is that you know that geometry is is a large part of it, and um, maybe one interesting thing to say very that's about more recent, some of the most recent ideas is that it um, when we think about the geometry of our space and time, it's kind of three spatial and one time dimension. It, it's a um, Physics is, in some sense, about something that's kind of four dimensional in a way, mm -hmm. and that a really interesting thing about um, some of the recent developments in number theory have been to realize that the um, these ideas that we were looking at, you know, naturally fit into a context where your your theory is for is kind of four dimensional. So, 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 geom I mean, geometry is a big part of this, and, and and we know a lot and feel a lot about you know two, one, two, three dimensional geometry. So wait, wait a minute. So we can at least rely on uh, the four dimensions of space and time, and say that we can get pretty far by working in that in those four dimensions. I thought you were going to scare me that we're going to have to go to many, 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 many more dimensions than that. My, my my point of view, which is which goes against a lot of these ideas about unification, is that no, this is really everything we do we know about really is about four dimensions that um and and that you can actually understand a lot of these structures that we've been seeing in fundamental physics and in, in number theory, just in terms of four dimensions that it's kind of, it's in some sense I would claim has been a really, um, has been kind of a mistake that, that physicists have made in for decades and decades to try to, to try to go to higher dimensions, to try to, to formulate a theory in higher dimensions. And then, then you're stuck with, the problem of how do you get rid of all these extra dimensions that you've created, and because because we only ever see anything in four dimensions, that kind of thing leads us astray. You think so? So creating all these extra dimensions just to get to give yourself extra degrees of freedom. Yeah, uh, isn't that? I mean, isn't that the process of mathematics? Is to create all of these trajectories for yourself, but eventually you have to end up at the, uh, at, the at like a final place. But it's okay to it's it's okay to sort of. Um, create abstract objects on your path to uh, proving something. Yeah, so, yeah, certainly. But, and from from mathematicians' point of view, I mean, the kinds of, mathematicians also are very different than physicists in that we like to develop very general theories. We like to, if we have an idea, we want to um, see what's the greatest generality in which you can talk about it. Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of most of the ways geometry is formulated um, by mathematicians, it, it really doesn't matter. It, it works in any dimension. We can do it. One, two, three, four, any any number. There's no particular for most of geometry, there's no particular special thing about four. But um and anyway, but but what physicists have have, found, have been trying to do over the years is try to understand these fundamental theories in a geometrical way. And it's very tempting to kind of just start bringing in extra dimensions to, to, and, and using them to explain the structure. But it, it um typically this this attempt kind of founders because you just don't know you end up not being able to explain why we only see four and anyway. 
It it is nice in the space of physics that, uh, like, if you look at Fermat's last theorem, it's much easier to prove that there's no solution for n equals three than it is for the general case. And and so I guess that's the nice benefit of being a physicist is you don't have to worry about the general case because we live in a universe with n equals four in this case. Yeah, yeah phys physicists are very interested in saying something about specific examples. And I find that interesting even when, when I'm trying to do things uh, in mathematics and I'm trying even teaching courses and uh, mathematics students, I find that I'm teaching them in a different way than um, most mathematicians because I'm very often f very focused on examples, on, on what's mm -hmm. what's kind of the crucial example that shows how this um, this powerful new mathematical technique, how it works and why you would want to do it. Um, and I'm less interested in kind of, you know, proving a precise theorem about exactly when it's going to work and when it's not going to work. Do you usually think about really simple examples, like uh, both for teaching and when you try to solve a difficult problem? Are you do you construct like the simplest possible examples that captures the fundamentals of the problem and try to solve it? Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. That's often a really fruitful way to, if you've got some idea, to you just to kind of try to boil it down to what's the simplest situation in which this kind of thing is going to happen and, and then try to really understand that and understand that and that that is almost always a really good way to get insight into it. do you work with uh paper and pen or like for example for me um coming from the programming side if you if i look at a model if i look at some kind of mathematical object i like to mess around with it sort of numerically uh, I just visualize different parts of it, visualize however I can. So most of the work is like with neural networks, for example, yep. is you try to play with the simplest possible example and just to build up intuition by, um, you know, any kind of object has a bunch of variables in it. Yeah. <laughs> and you start to mess around with them in different ways and visualize in different ways to start to build intuition. Or do you go the Einstein route and just imagine like uh, everything inside your mind and sort of build like thought experiments and then work purely on paper and pen. Well, the, the problem with this kind of stuff that I'm interested in is it, you, you rarely can kind of, it's rarely something that is really kind of, or even the simplest example, you know, it can, is you can kind of see what's going on by looking at something happening in three dimensions. Right. There's, there's generally this, the structures involved are, um, either they're more abstract or if you try to kind of embed them in some kind of space and where you could um, manipulate them in some kind of geometrical way, it, it's gonna be a much higher dimensional space. So even simple examples, the embedding them into three dimensional space, you're losing a lot. Yeah, or but but to capture what you're, what you're trying to understand about them, you have to go to four or more dimensions. So it starts to get to be hard to, I mean, you can train yourself to, to try it as much as to kind of think about things in, in your mind. And, you know, I often use, use pad and paper and I'm often, if I'm in my office, I often use the blackboard. Um, and you are kind of drawing things, but they're really kind of more abstract representations of how things are supposed to fit together. And they're not really, unfortunately, not just kind of really living in three dimensions where you can under Are we supposed to be sad or excited by the fact that our human minds can't fully comprehend the kind of mathematics you're talking about? I, I mean, <laughs> what do we make of that? I mean, to me, that makes me quite sad. It makes me, it makes it seem like there's a giant mystery out there that we'll never truly get to experience directly. It is kind of sad, you know, how difficult this is. I mean, or I would put it a different way that, um, you know, most questions that people have about this kind of thing, you know, you couldn't, you can give them a really a, a true answer and really understand it, but. The problem is is one more of um of time. It's like, yes, you know, I could explain to you how this works, but you'd have to be willing to sit down with me and and you know work at this repeatedly for you know for hours and days and weeks. And you'd, you'd have, I mean, it's just going to take that long for your mind to really wrap itself around what's going on. And um and that so that does make things in, in, inaccessible, which is a uh, which is sad, but it. I get. It. I mean, it's just kind of part of life that we all have a limited amount of time, and we have to decide what we're gonna what we're gonna spend our time doing. 
Speaking of a limited amount of time, we only have uh, a few hours, maybe a few days together here on this yeah. podcast. <laughs> uh, and let me ask you the question of um, amongst many of the ideas that you work on in mathematics and physics, what do you use the most beautiful idea or one of the most beautiful ideas, maybe a surprising idea? And once again, unfortunately, the way life works, we only have a limited time together to try to convey <laughs> such an idea. Okay. Well. Actually, let, let me just t tell you something, which I, I, I'm tempted to kind of ex start trying to explain what I think is this most powerful idea that brings together math and physics, ideas about groups and representations and how it fits in quantum mechanics. And, but in some sense, I wrote a whole textbook about that, and I don't think we really have time to get very far into it. So, Well, can I actually, on a small tangent, you, you did write a paper towards the Grant Unified Theory of Mathematics and Physics. Um, Maybe you could step there first. What is the key idea in that paper? Well, I think we, we've kind of gone gone over that. I think that the key idea is what we were talking about earlier. That um, that just kind of a claim that if you look and see what's the have been successful ideas in unification in physics and over the last um, fifty years or so, and what um has been happening in mathematics and the kind of thing that Frankel's book is about, that these are very much the same kind of mathematics, and so it's kind of an argument that there really is. You shouldn't be looking to unify just math or just fundamental physics, but taking inspiration for looking for new ideas in fundamental physics that they are going to be in the same direction of, um, of getting deeper into mathematics and looking for more inspiration in mathematics from these successful ideas about fundamental physics. Could you put words to sort of the disciplines we're trying to unify? So you said number theory. Are we literally talking about all the major fields of mathematics? So it's like uh, the number theory, geometry, uh, so the, like differential geometry, topology, like. Yeah, so the, I mean, one one name for this, that this is acquired in, in mathematics is the so-called Langlands program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this started out in mathematics. It's that, you know, Robert Langlands kind of realized that a lot of what people were doing in, um, that was starting to be really successful in, in number theory in the, 60s and so that that this actually was anyway that, that that this could be could be thought of in terms of um these ideas about symmetry in groups and representations and and in a way that was also close to some ideas about about geometry and um then more later on in the 80s and 90s there was something called um geometric langlands that people realized that you could take what people have been doing in number theory in langlands and 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 get rid just forget about the number theory and ask what is this telling you about geometry mm -hmm. and you get a whole some new insights into certain kinds of geometry that way so it's anyway that that's kind of the name for this area is langlands and geometric langlands and, and just recently in the last few months there's been um there's kind of a really major paper that uh, appeared by uh, Peter Schulze and Laurent Farg where they you know made you know some some a serious advance in trying to understand a very much kind of a local problem of what happens in number theory near a certain prime number. And they turn this into a problem of exactly the, the kind that geometric Langlands people had been doing, these kind of pure a pure geometry problem. And they found by generalizing the mathematics, they could actually reformulate it in that way. And it, it, it worked perfectly well. So. well. One of the things that makes me sad is, you know, I'm a pretty knowledgeable person and then uh, what is it at least I'm in the neighborhood of like theoretical computer science right and it's still way out of my reach and so many people talk about like Langlands for example is one of the most brilliant people in mathematics yeah. and just really admire his work and I can't it's like almost I can't hear the music that he composed and it makes me sad yeah you know? well I mean I, I think that unfortunately it, it's not just you is I think even most mathematicians have no really don't actually understand what this is about. I mean the the group of people who really understand all these ideas and so for instance this paper of of uh, Schultz and Farg that I was talking about the number of people who really actually understand how that works is anyway on very very small and so it's uh, so I I think even you find if you talk to mathematicians and physicists even they will often feel that you know there's this really interesting sounding stuff going on and which I should be able to understand. It's kind of in my own field. I have a PhD in, but it still seems it's pretty clearly far <laughs> beyond me right now. 
Well, if we can step into the back to the question of beauty, uh, is, is there an idea that maybe is a little bit smaller yeah. that you find beautiful in the space of mathematics or physics? There's there's an idea that you know I kind of went got a physics PhD and spent a lot of time learning about mathematics and I guess it it was embarrassing that I, I hadn't really actually understood this very simple idea um, until and kind of learned learned it when I actually started teaching math classes, which is that maybe that that there there maybe there's a simple way to explain kind of the fundamental way in which algebra and geometry are connected. So you normally think of geometry as about these spaces and these points and and you think of algebra as this very abstract thing about with these abstract objects that satisfy certain kinds of relations. You can multiply them and add them and do stuff, but it's it's completely abstract and there's nothing geometric about it. But the um the kind of really fundamental idea is uh, that unifies algebra and geometry is to th is to realize is to think when any, whenever anybody gives you what you call an algebra, some abstract thing of things that you can multiply and add, that you should ask yourself, is that algebra the space of functions on some geometry? So one of the most surprising examples of this, for instance, is a, I mean, a, a standard kind of thing that seems to have nothing to do with geometry is the um, is the, the the integer. So then there you can you can multiply them and add them. It's a, it's, it's an algebra, but the um, it has seems to have nothing to do with geometry, but what you can it turns out. But if you ask yourself this question and ask, you know, is our integers? Can you think if somebody gives you an integer, can you think of it as a function on some space, on some geometry? And it turns out that yes, you can. And the space is the space of prime numbers. And so what you do is you just if somebody gives you an integer, you can make a function on the prime numbers by just, you know, at each prime number taking that. That integer modulo that prime. So if uh, mm -hmm. if you say I don't know if you give given ten, you know ten, and you ask what is its value at two? Well, it's it's five times two, so mod two it's zero, so it has zero one. What it, what is what is its value at three? Well, it's nine plus one, so it's it's one mod three, so it, it's 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 zero at two, it's one at three, and you can kind of keep going. And so this is really kind of a, a truly fundamental idea. It's at the basis of what's called algebraic geometry, and it just links these two parts of mathematics that look completely different. And it, it's just an incredibly powerful idea, and, and so much of mathematics emerges from this kind of simple relation. So uh, you're talking about mapping from one discrete space to another. To another. So to, uh, um, for a second, I thought perhaps uh, mapping like a continuous space to a discrete space, like functions over a continuous space. Uh, because well, yeah, well, you can, I mean you can take if somebody gives you a space, you can ask, you can say, well, let's let's, and and this is also this is part of the same idea. The part of the same idea is that if you try and do geometry and somebody tells you here's a space, that what you should do is you should wait to say wait wait a minute maybe I should be trying to solve this using algebra. And so if I do that, the way to start is you give me the space, I start to think about the functions of the space. Okay, so for to each point in the space, I associate a number. I can take different kinds of functions and different kinds of values, but but basically functions on a space. So what this insight is telling you is that if you're a geometer, often the way to to to, to work is to trans change your problem into algebra by changing your space. Stop thinking about your space and the points in it, and think about the functions on it. Got it. And if you're and if you're an algebraist and you th and you got these abstract algebraic gadgets that you're multiplying and adding, say, wait a minute, are those gadgets? Can I think of them in some way as a function on a space? What would that space be, and what kind of functions would they be? And that going back and forth really brings these two completely different looking areas of mathematics together. Do you have uh, particular examples where it allowed to prove some difficult things by jumping from one to the other? Is that something that's a part of modern mathematics, where such jumps are made? Oh yeah, so this is kind of all the time. A lot, much, much of modern number theory is kind of based on this idea. But and and when you start doing this, you start to realize that you need, you know, what simple things, simple things on one side, and the algebra you know, start to require you to think about the other side about geometry in a new way. You have to kind of get a more sophisticated idea about geometry, or if you start thinking about the functions on a space, 
you may have, you may need a more sophisticated kind of algebra, but um, but in some sense, I mean, much or most of modern number theory is based upon this move to to geometry, and um, there's also a lot of geometry and topology is also based upon. Yeah, change, change. If you want to understand the topology of something, you look at the functions. You do Durham cohomology, and you get the topology. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, let me let me ask you then the ridiculous question. You said that this idea is beautiful. Uh, can you formalize the definition of be- the word beautiful, and why is this beautiful? Like, well, first, why is this beautiful, and second, um, what is beautiful? Yeah, well. And I think there are many different things you can find beautiful for different reasons. I mean, I think in, in this context, the notion of beauty, I think really is just kind of that idea is beautiful if it packages a huge amount of kind of power and information into a, something very simple. So in some sense, you, I mean, the, the, the you can almost kind of try and measure it in the sense of, you know, what's the, what are the implications of this idea? What non-trivial things does it tell you versus you know how 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 simply can you can you express the idea and so so, so the level of compression yeah. cor- uh what is it correlates with uh, beauty yeah that's that's one one aspect of it mm-hmm. and so you can start to tell that an idea is becoming uglier and uglier as you start kind of having to you know it doesn't quite do what you want so you throw in something else to the idea and you keep doing that until you get what you want, but that's how you know you're doing something uglier and uglier when you have to kind of keep adding in more, more, more into what what was originally a fairly simple idea and making it more and more complicated to get what you want. Okay, so let's put some uh, philosophical words on the table and try to make some sense of them. One word is beauty. Another one is simplicity, as you mentioned. Another one is truth. Mm-hmm. So. Do you have a sense if I give you two theories, one is simpler, one is more complicated. Do you have a sense of which one is more likely to be true to uh, capture deeply the fabric of reality? The simple one or the more complicated one? I, yeah, I think all of our evidence, what we see in the history of the subject is the the, the, the simpler one, though often it's, a surprise, it's simpler in a surprising way, but um, yeah, that that we just don't, we just anyway. When the, the kind of best theories have been coming coming up with are ultimately, when not properly understood, relatively simple and uh, much much simpler than they, you would expect them to be. Do you have a good explanation why that is? Is it just because humans want it to be that way? Are we just like ultra biased, and we uh-huh. we, we we just kind of convince ourselves? That simple is better because we find simplicity beautiful? Or is there something about at the our actual universe that uh, at the core is simple? My own belief is that there is something about a universe that is, that's simple. And as I was trying to say that, you know, there is some some kind of fundamental thing about math, physics, and physics and all this, all this picture, which is um which which is in some sense simple. I mean, it's true that, you know, it, it it's of course true that you know our minds have certain have are very limited and can certainly do certain things and not others. So it, it's it, it's in principle possible that there's some great insight. In, there are a lot of insights into the way the world works, which just aren't accessible to us because that's not the way our minds work. We don't, and that what we're seeing, this kind of simplicity, is just because that's all we ever have any hope of seeing. But so there's a uh, brilliant physicist by the name of Sabine Hassenfelder who both agrees and disagrees with you, or I suppose agrees that uh, the final answer will be simple. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, simplicity and beauty leads us astray in the, lo- in the local pockets of scientific progress. Uh, do, you, uh, do you agree with her disagreement? Do you disagree with her agreement? <laughs> and agree with the agreement? Uh, well, I, I, and so I, anyway, I, 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 yes, I found it was really fascinating reading her book. and. And I, and and I, anyway, I was finding disagreeing with with a lot, but then at the end, when she says yes, when we find yeah. there, when we actually figure this out, it will it will be simple. And and the, okay, so so we we agree in the end. But um, does beauty lead us astray? Which is the the core thesis of her work in that book. I actually, I, I guess I do disagree with her on on that so much. I don't think, and especially, and I actually fairly strongly disagree with her about sometimes sometimes the way she'll refer to math and. So the problem is, 
you know, physicists and people in general just refer to it as math, and and they're often um, they're they're often meaning not what I would call math, which is the interesting ideas of math, but just co some complicated calculation. And and so um, I, I guess my feeling about it is more that it, it's very the the problem with talking about simplicity and and using simplicity as a guide is that it's very um, it's very easy to fool yourself, and you know it's very easy to decide to you know to, to to fall in love with an idea. You you have an idea, you think, oh, this is this is great, and you fall in love with it. And it's like any kind of love affair; it's very easy to believe that you know your the object of your affections is much more beautiful than they others might think, and they, that they really are. And that's very very easy to do. So um, if you say I'm just going to pursue ideas about beauty and this and mathematics and this, it's extremely easy to to just fool yourself, I think. Um, and I think that's a lot of what sh the, the story is she was thinking of about where people have gone astray that I think it's, I would argue that it's more people, it's not that there was some simple, powerful, wonderful idea which they'd found and it, it turned out not to be, um, not to be useful, but it was more that they kind of fooled themselves that this was actually a better idea than, than it really was and that it was, Simpler, more beautiful than it really was is is, is a lot of the story. Um, I see. So, so it's not that the simplicity would be leads us astray. Is that just people are people and they uh, fall in love with with whatever idea they have, and then they they weave narratives around that idea, or they present it in such a way that uh, emphasizes uh, the simplicity and the beauty. Uh, yeah, that's part of it. But I mean, the thing about physics that you have is that you you know what what really can tell. You know, if you can do an experiment and check and see if nature is really doing what your your idea expects, that you you do in principle have a way of, of really of testing it. And and it's certainly true that if you um you know if you thought you had a simple idea and that doesn't work, and you go out and do an experiment and what actually does work is some more maybe some more complicated version of it, that can certainly happen, and that 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 can be true. I think her emphasis is more that I don't really disagree with is that um, people should be concentrating on um, when they're trying to get, develop better theories on more on on self consistency, not so much on beauty, but you know, not is this idea beautiful, but you know, is there something about the theory which is not quite consistent, and that and use that as a guide to that there's something wrong there which needs fixing, and and so I, I think. That part of her argument, I think I was, we're, we're on the same page about. Uh, what's, what is consistency and inconsistencies? What, what, what exactly, um, do you have examples in mind? Well, it, it can be just simple inconsistency between theory and, and, and experiment that if you, so we have this great fundamental theory, but there are some things that we see out there which don't seem to fit in it, like, like, like dark energy and dark matter, for instance. But if there's something which you can't test experimentally, I think, you know, she would argue, and I would agree that, for instance, if you're trying to think about gravity and how are you going to have a quantum theory of gravity, you should kind of be, you know, test any of your ideas with kind of, kind of a, a, th a thought experiment. You know, is does this actually give a consistent picture of what's going to happen, of what happens in this particular situation, or not? That's so. Th this is a good example. You've written about this. Um... You know, since quantum gravitational effects are really small, super small, arguably unobservably small, should we have hope to arrive at a theory of quantum gravity somehow? What are the different ways we can get there? You've mentioned that you're not as interested in that effort because basically, yes, you cannot uh, have uh, ways to scientifically validate it given the tools of today. Yeah. I've actually, you know, I've, I've over the years certainly spent a lot of time learning about gravity and about attempts to quantize it, but it, it it hasn't been that much in the past the focus of what I've been thinking about. But I mean, my feeling was always, you know, as I think Sabina would agree that the, uh, you know, one way you can pursue this if you if you can't do experiments is just this kind of search for consistency. You know, it, it can be remarkably hard to come up with a completely consistent model of model of this and, and a way that brings together quantum mechanics and general relativity. And that's, I think, kind of been the traditional way that people who have pursued quantum gravity have often pursued, you know, 
we're, we're, we have the best route to finding a consistent theory of quantum gravity. And string theorists will tell you this, other, other people will tell you it. It's, it's kind of what people argue about. But, but the problem with, with all of that is that you end up, um, the danger is that you end up with that, that, that everybody could be successful. Everybody, everybody's program for how to find a theory of quantum gravity, you know, ends up with something that is consistent. And so, and in some sense, you could argue this is what happened to the string theorists. They, um, they solved their problem of finding a consistent theory of quantum gravity, and they ended, but they found ten of the five hundred solutions. So, you, you know, if you believe that everything that they would like to be true is true, well, okay, you've got a theory, but it's it, it ends up being kind of useless because it, it's just one of an infinite, essentially infinite number of things which you have no way to experimentally distinguish. And so, this is a just a depressing situation. Um, but but I, I but I do think that there there is a um so so again I think pursuing ideas about what more about beauty and how can you integrate and unify it, these issues about gravity with other things we know about physics and can you find a theory which where they where these fit together in a in a way that makes sense and and, and hopefully predict something that's much more promising. Well, it makes sense and hopefully I mean we'll sneak up yeah. onto this question a bunch of times because you kind of said. Uh, a few slightly contradictory things, which is like, it's nice to have a theory that's consistent, but then if the theory is consistent, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. <laughs> so like- it's, it's, it's not enough, it's not enough. It's not enough, and that's the problem. So it's like, it keeps coming back to, okay, there should be some experimental validation. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about string theory. You've been- uh, a bit of an outspoken critic of string theory. <laughs> Maybe one question first to ask is what is string theory? And uh, beyond that, why is it wrong? Or rather, as the title of your blog says, not even wrong. Okay. Well, one interesting thing about the current state of string theory is that it, I, I think it, I'd argue it, it's actually very, very difficult to, at this point, to say what string theory means. If people say they're string theorists, what they mean and what they're doing is a uh, is kind of hard to, it's hard to pin down the meaning of the term but the but the initial meaning i think goes back to um there was kind of a, a series of developments starting in 1984 in which people felt that they had found a unified theory of of our so-called standard model of, of of all the standard well well known kind of particle interactions and gravity and it all fit together in a quantum theory and that you could do this in a very specific way by instead of thinking about having a quantum theory of particles moving around in space-time, think about a uh, quantum theory of kind of one-dimensional loops moving around in space-time, so-called strings. And so um, instead of one degree of freedom, these have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. It's a much more complicated theory, but you can imagine, okay, we're gonna quantize this theory of loops moving around in space-time, and what they found is that they is that you could make you could do this and you could fairly relatively straightforwardly make sense of 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 such a quantum theory but only if space and time together were 10 dimensional and so then you had this problem again the problem i referred to at the beginning of okay now once you make that move you got to get rid of six dimensions and so the hope was that you could get rid of the six dimensions by making them very small, and that consistency of the theory would require these that these six dimensions um, satisfy a very specific condition called being a kalabi yau manifold, and that we knew very, very few examples of this. So what got a lot of people very excited back in 84, 85 was the hope that you could just take this 10-dimensional um, string theory and find one of a limited number of possible ways of of getting rid of six dimensions by making them small, and then you would end up with a, an effective four-dimensional theory which looked like the real world. This was the hope. So then there's then a, a very long story about what happened to that hope over the years. I mean, I, I would argue, and part of the point of the book and its title was that, um, you know, that this this ultimately was, was, was a failure, that you ended up, that this idea just didn't, um, <clears throat> There ended up being just too many ways of doing this, and you didn't know how to do this consistently. Um, 
that it was kind of not, not even wrong in the sense that you couldn't even pin, you, you never could pin it down well enough to actually get a real falsifiable prediction out of it that would tell you it was wrong. But it was um, it was kind of in the in, in the realm of ideas which initially look good, but the more you look at them, they just um, they don't work out the way the way you want, and they they don't actually end up carrying the power or the that you originally had this vision of. And yes, the the book title is not even wrong. Your blog, your excellent blog title is not even wrong. Okay, but there's nevertheless been a lot of excitement about string theory through the decades, as you mentioned. Uh, what are the different flavors of ideas that came, uh, like that branched out? You mentioned 10 dimensions, you mentioned loops with infinite degrees of freedom. What what other interesting ideas to you that kind of emerged from this world? Well, yeah, I mean, the problem with talking about the whole subject, and well, partly one reason I wrote the book, is that you know it it, it gets very very complicated. I mean, there's a, a huge amount, you know, hu- a lot of people got very interested in this. A lot of people worked on it, and 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 in some sense, I think what happened is exactly because the idea didn't really work, that this caused people to. You know, instead of focusing on this one idea and digging in and working on that, they just kind of kept trying new things. And so people, I think, ended up wandering around in a very, very rich space of ideas about mathematics and physics and discovering you know, all sorts of really interesting things. It's just the problem is there tended to be an inverse relationship between how interesting and beautiful and fruitful this new idea that they were trying to pursue was and how much it looked like the real world. <laughs> so there's a lot of beautiful mathematics came out of it. I think one of the most spectacular is what the um, physicists call two-dimensional conformal field theory. And so these are basically quantum field theories and kind of think of it as one space and one time dimension, which you know have just this huge amount of symmetry and, and um, a huge amount of structure, which you know, and just some totally fantastic mathematics behind it. And, um, and again, and, and some of that mathematics is exactly also what appears in the Langlands program. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the um, first interaction between math and physics around the Langlands program has been around these two-dimensional conformal field theories. Is there um, something you could say about what the major problems are with string theory? So like um, besides that there's no experimental validation, you've uh, written that a big hole in string theory has been its perturbative definition. Yeah. Perhaps that's one. Can you explain what that means? Well, maybe to begin with, I mean, I think that, I mean, the simplest thing to, to say is, you know, the, the initial idea really was that, okay, we're, we have this, instead of what's great is we have this thing that only works, that's very structured and has to work in a certain way for it to make sense. And, um, but but then you ended up you ended up in ten space time dimensions, and so to get back to physics, you had to get rid of five of the dimensions, six of the dimensions, and the, the bottom line I would say in some sense is very simple that what people just discovered is just there. There's kind of no particularly nice way of doing this. There's an infinite number of ways of doing it, and you can get whatever you want depending on how you do it. So the you you end up the whole program of starting at ten dimensions and getting to four just kind of collapses out of a a lack of any way to kind of get to where you want because you can get anything. The, the hope around that problem has always been that the standard formulation that we have of string theory, which is, you can go in by the name perturbative, but it, it's kind of, um, there's a standard way we know of given a classical theory of constructing a quantum theory and and, and working with it, which is, this the so-called perturbation theory that um that we know how to do and that that by itself just just doesn't doesn't give you any hint as to what to do about the six dimensions so actual perturbative string theory by itself really only works in 10 dimensions so you have to start making some kinds of assumptions about how i'm going to go beyond this formulation that we really understand of string theory and get rid of these six six dimensions so kind of the simplest one was the um the Klabiau postulate. But um when that didn't really work out, people have tried more and more different things. And and the hope has always been that the solution to this problem would be that you would find a a deeper and better understanding of what string theory is 
that would actually go beyond this perturbative expansion and which would um which would generalize this and and that and that once you had that it would um it would solve this problem of it would pick out what to do with the six dimensions how difficult is, is this problem so if i could restate the problem it seems like there's a very consistent physical world operating in four dimensions and uh, how do you map a consistent physical world in 10 dimensions to a consistent physical world in four dimensions? Right. And how, how difficult is this problem? Is, it, is that something you can even answer? Um, just w in terms of physics intuition, in terms of mathematics, mapping well, from 10 well, dimensions to four dimensions. Well, basically, I mean, you have to get rid of the of six of the dimensions. So, so there's, I mean, there, there's, kind of two ways of doing it. One is what we call compactification. You say that there really are 10 dimensions, but for whatever reason, six of them are really are so, so small, we can't see them. So you basically t start out with 10 dimensions and what we call, you know, make, make, make six of them not go out to infinity, but just kind of a finite extent and then make that size go down so, so small it's unobservable. But that's, that's cool. like, that's a math trick. So can you also help me build an intuition about how rich and interesting the world in those six dimensions is? So compactification seems to imply that you, well, <laughs> it's not it's very interesting. Of, well, no, but, but the problem is that what you learn if you start doing math, mathematics and looking at geometry and topology and, and more and more dimensions is that, I mean, <laughs> Asking the question like, "What are all possible six-dimensional spaces?" is just a, it's kind of an unanswerable question. It's just uh, I mean, there, it's even kind of technically undecidable in some way. There's just there's just too too there are too many things you can do with all these. If you start trying to make if you start trying to make one-dimensional spaces, it's like, well, you, you got a line, you can make a circle, you can make graphs, you can kind of see what you can do. But as you go to higher and higher dimensions, there are just so many ways you can put things together of and get something of that dimensionality. And so it, it, it um, unless you have some very, very strong principle, which is gonna pick out some very specific ones of these six dimensional spaces, and there are just too many of them and you can get anything you want, but. Um, so if you have 10 dimensions, the kind of things that happen, say that's actually the way that's actually the fabric of our reality's 10 dimensions. There's a limited set of behaviors of objects. I don't know, even know what the right terminology to use that can occur within, the, within those dimensions, like in reality. Yeah. Yeah. And so like what I'm getting at is like, is there some consistent constraints? So if you have some constraints that map to reality, then you can start saying like, dimension number seven is kind of boring. All the excitement happens in the spatial dimensions one, two, three, yeah. and time is also kind of boring. Yeah. And like some are more exciting than others, or we can use our metric of beauty. Uh, some dimensions are more beautiful than others. Once you have an actual understanding of what actually happens in those dimensions in our physical world, as opposed to sort of all the possible things that could happen. In some sense, I mean, just the basic fact is you need to get rid of them. We don't see them. So you, you need to somehow explain them. You have to, you, the main thing you're trying to do is to explain why we're not seeing them. And so you you can, you have to come up with some theory of these extra dimensions and, and how they're going to behave. And string theory gives you some ideas about how to do that. But but the, the bottom line is where you're trying to go with this whole theory you're creating is to just make all of its effects essentially unobservable. So it's a, it's not a really, <laughs> it's an inherently kind of dubious and worrisome thing that you're trying to do there. Why are you just adding in all this stuff and then trying to explain why we don't see it? I mean, it just. This may be a dumb question, but it's, is this an obvious thing to state that those six dimensions are unobservable or anything beyond four dimensions is, is unobservable or, do you leave a little door open to saying the current tools of physics, and obviously our brains are unable to observe them, yeah. but we may need to come up with methodologies for observing them. So as opposed to collapsing your mathematical theory into four dimensions, or leaving the door open a little bit to, maybe we need to come up with tools that actually allow us to directly measure those dimensions. 
Yes, I mean, you, I mean, you can certainly ask. You know, assume that that we've got model, look look at models with more dimensions and ask, you know, what would the observable effects, how would we right. know this? And you go out and do experiments. So for instance, you have a, like gravitationally, you have an inverse square law of forces. Okay, if you had more dimensions, that inverse square law would change to something else. So you can go and start measuring the inverse square law and say, okay, an inverse square law is working, but maybe if I get, get and it turns out to be actually kind of very, very hard to measure gravitational effects at even kind of, you know, somewhat macroscopic distances because they're so small. Mm -hmm. So you can you can start looking at the inverse square law and say start trying to measure it at shorter and shorter distances and, and see if there were extra dimensions at those distance scales, you would start to see the inverse square law fail. And um, so people look for that, and again, you don't see it, but. You can. I mean, there's all sorts of experiments of this kind you can you can imagine, which test for effects of extra dimensions at different at different distance scales. But you know, none of them. I mean, they they all just don't work. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. But you can say, ah, but it, it it's if it's just it's just much much smaller. You can say that. <laughs> which, by the way, makes LIGO and uh, the detection of gravitational waves quite an incredible project. Yeah. Ed Witten is often brought up as one of the most brilliant mathematicians and physicists ever. Uh, what do you make of him and his work on string theory? Well, I think he, you know, he's a truly remarkable figure. I've uh, you know, had the pleasure of meeting him first when he was a postdoc. And um, I mean, he's a, just completely ama amazing um, mathematician and physicist. And, uh, you know, he's, Quite a bit smarter than just about about any of the rest of us, and also more hardworking. And it's a it's a kind of frightening combination to see how much he's been able to do. And um, but I would actually argue that you know his his greatest work, the things that he's done that have been of just this mind blowing significance of giving us. I mean, he's completely revolutionized some areas of mathematics. He's totally revolutionized the way we understand the relations between mathematics and physics. And most of those. His his greatest work is is stuff that doesn't have has little or nothing to do with string theory. I mean, for instance, he um, you know, he so he was actually one of fields. The very strange thing about him, in some sense, is that he um, he doesn't have a Nobel Prize. So there, there's a very large number of people who are nowhere near as smart as he is, and don't work anywhere near as hard, who have Nobel prizes. I think he just had the misfortune of coming into the field at a time when things had gotten much, much, much tougher, and and nobody. Really had, no matter how smart you were, it was very hard to come up with a new idea that was going to work physically and get you a Nobel Prize. But he, but he, um, you know, he he had got a Fields Medal for a certain work he did in um, in mathematics, and that's just completely unheard of. You know, for mathematicians to give a Fields Medal to someone outside their field in mm -hmm. physics is, is really, um, you know, you, you wouldn't have before it. He came around. I don't think anybody would have thought that was even conceivable. So these things, um, he came into the field of theoretical physics at a time when, uh, and still t to today, is you can't get a Nobel Prize for purely theoretical work. The specific problem of trying to do better than the standard, the standard model is just this insanely successful thing. And, and it kind of came together in 1973, pretty much. And post, and so, and, and all of the people who kind of were involved in, that coming together, you know, many of them ended up with Nobel Prizes for that. But, but if you look post nineteen seventy three, pretty much it, it's a little bit more. There's some edge cases, if you like. But the if you look post nineteen seventy three at what people have done to try to do better than the standard model and to to get a better unified theory, it really hasn't. It's been too hard a problem. It hasn't worked. The theory's too good, and so it's not that other people. Went out there and did and did it, and uh, not him, and that they got Nobel prizes for doing it. It's just that no one really the kind of thing he's been trying to do with string theory is not um no one has been able to do since 1973. Is there something you can say about the standard model? So the four laws of physics that seems to work very well, and uh, yet people are striving to do more, talking about unification, so on. Why? What's wrong? What's broken about the standard model? Why, why does it need to be improved? I mean, the thing which gets most attention is, um, is, is gravity, that we have trouble. Um, so you want to, you in some sense, integrate 
integrate what we know about gra- the gravitational force w- with it in, uh, and have a unified quantum field theory that has gravitational interactions also. So that's the big problem everybody talks about. Um, I mean, but, it, but it's also true that if you look at the standard model, it has these very, very deep, beautiful ideas, but there's certain aspects of it that are very, <laughs> that, that, that are, let's, let's just say that they're not beautiful. They're not, um, you have to, th- to make the thing work, you have to throw in lot, lots and lots of extra parameters at various points. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the so-called, uh, you know, the so-called Higgs mechanism in the Higgs field. That if you look at the theory, it's everything is, if you forget about the Higgs field and what it needs to do, the rest of the theory is, um, is, is very, very constrained and has very, very few free parameters, really a very small number. There's a very small number of parameters and a few integers which tell you what the theory is. To make this work as a theory of the real world, you need a, a Higgs field and you need to, it needs to do, to do something. And once you introduce that Higgs field, all sorts of parameters um, make an appearance. So now when we've got 20 or 30 or whatever, parameters that are going to tell you what all the masses of things are and what's going to happen. So you've gone from a very tightly constrained thing with a couple parameters to uh, this this thing which the minute you put it in you had to add all this extra all these extra parameters to make things work. And so that it may be one argument as well that's just the way the world is and the fact that you don't find that aesthetically pleasing is just your problem or Maybe we live in a multiverse, and those numbers are just different in every universe. And, but it, but you know another reasonable conjecture is just that well, this is just telling us that there's something we don't understand about what's going on in a deeper way, which would explain those numbers. And there's some kind of deeper idea about where the Higgs field comes from and what's going on, which we haven't figured out yet, and that that's that's what we should look for. But to stick on string theory a little bit longer. Could you play devil's advocate and try to argue for string theory, why it is something that deserved the effort that it got and still, con- like if you think of it as a flame, still should be a little flame that keeps keeps burning? Well, I, I think the, I mean, the, the, the most positive argument for it is, is all the, um, you know, all sorts of new ideas about mathematics and about parts of physics really emerged from it. So it was very a fruitful um, source of ideas. And I think, you know, this is actually one argument you'll definitely, which I kind of agree with, you'll hear from from Witten and from other string theorists that, you know, this is a, this is just such a fruitful and inspiring idea. And it's led to so many other different things coming out of it that, you know, there must be something right about this. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's, you know, okay. That anyway, I think that that's probably the strong, the strongest thing that they, that, that they've got. Um, but you you don't think there's aspects to it that could be uh, neighboring to to a, to a, uh, to a theory that does unify everything to a theory of everything like it could it may not be exactly um, uh, exactly the theory but uh, sticking on it longer might get us closer to the theory of everything. Well, the problem with it now really is that you really don't know what it is now. You you've never nobody has ever kind of come up with this non perturbative. Theory, so there, there, it's it's become more and more frustrating and, and an odd activity to try to argue with string theorists about string theory because it's become less and less well defined what 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 it is, and it's become actually more and more kind of a whether you you have this weird phenomenon of people calling themselves string theorists when they've never actually worked on any theory where there are any strings anywhere. So what has actually happened kind of sociologically is that you started out with this fairly well-defined proposal. And then I would argue because that didn't work, people and branched out in all sorts of directions doing all sorts of things that became farther and farther removed from that. And for sociological reasons, the ones who kind of started out or, or now or, or, or were trained by the people who worked on that have now become this string string theorist and um and but but it, but it's become almost more kind of a tribal denominator than a um well, thing. so it's very hard to know what you're arguing about when you're arguing about string theory these days well to push back on that a little bit i mean string theory it's just a term right it doesn't like you could uh like this is the way language evolves 
is it could start to represent something more than just the theory that involves strings. It could represent the uh, the effort to unify the laws of physics, right? Yeah. At uh, at high dimensions with these super tiny objects, right, or something like that. I mean, we, we can sort of uh, put string theory aside. So, for example, neural networks in the space of machine learning. There was a, a time when they were extremely popular. They became much, much less popular to a point where if you mention neural networks, you're getting no funding and uh, you're not going to be respected at conferences. And then once again, uh, neural networks became all the all the rage about 10, 15 years ago. And as it goes up and down, and a lot of people would argue that uh, using terminology like machine learning and deep learning is um, is, uh, you know, often misused, over general, you know, everything that works is deep learning, everything that doesn't isn't, yeah. or something like that. You know, that's just the way, uh, hum again, we're back to sociological yeah. things. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is if, if we leave the sociological mess aside, uh, do we throw out the, the baby with the bathwater? Is there some, besides the side effects of nice ideas from the Ed Wittens of the world, is there some core truths there that we should st stick by in 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 the full beautiful mess of a space that we call string theory that people call string theory? You're right. It is kind of a common problem that you know how what you what you call some field changes and evolves and in interesting ways as as the field changes. But I mean. I guess that what I would argue is the you know the the initial understanding of string theory that was quite specific. We're talking about a specific idea: ten-dimensional superstrings compactified in six dimensions. That, to my mind, the the really bad thing that's happened to the subject is that you it's hard to get people to admit, at least publicly, that that was a failure, that this really didn't work, and so de facto, what people do is people stop doing that and they start doing more interesting things. But they keep telling, talking to the public about about str string theory and referring back to that idea and using that as kind of the starting point and as kind of the the place where the the whole where where the whole tribe starts and everything has comes from. And so the the problem with this is that having as your as your initial name and, and what what everything points back to something which um which which really didn't work out. It kind of makes everybody makes everything. You've created this potentially very very interesting field with interesting things happening, but you know, people in high, in graduate school take courses on string theory and, and everything kind of. And this is what you tell the public, in which you're continually pointing back. So you're continually pointing back to this idea which never worked out as your guiding inspiration, and it, it really kind of deforms the whole your whole way of um, your your hopes of making progress and. That's to me. I think you know the kind of worst thing that's that's happened in in this field. Okay, sure. So there's a lack of transparency, a sort of authenticity about communicating the things that failed yeah. uh, in the past, and so you don't have a clear picture of like firm ground that you're standing on. But again, those are sociological things, and yeah. I, I there's a bunch of questions I want to ask you. So one, what's your intuition about? Um, why the original idea failed. So what can you say about why you're pretty sure has it has failed? I mean, and, and the initial idea was, as I tried to explain it, it was quite seductive in that that you, you could see why Witten and others got excited by it. It was, um, you know, it, it, at the time it looked like there were only a few of these possible clabias that would work. And it looked like, okay, we just have to understand this very specific model in these very specific six dimensional spaces and we're gonna get everything. And so it was a very subjective idea, but it just, you know, as people learn, worked more and more about it, 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 it just didn't, um, it, it, they just kind of realized that there are just more and more things you can do with these six dimensions and you can't, and this this is just not going to work. Meaning like it's, I mean, what, what, what was the failure um, mode? Here is is you could just have an infinite number of possibilities that you could do. So it's you can come up with any theory you want. You can fit quantum mechanics. You can you can explain gravity. You can explain anything you want with it. Right, right. Is that the basic failure mode? Yeah. So it's a failure mode of kind of that this idea ended up 
being kind of being essentially empty that it, it, it just didn't doesn't ends up not telling you anything because it's consistent with just about any, just about anything and so i mean there's a co complex if you try and talk with string theorists about this now i mean there's a there's an argument there's a long argument over this about whether um you know oh no 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 maybe there still are constraints coming coming out of this idea or not and or maybe we live in a multiverse and you know every everything is true anyway so you can there, there are various ways you can kind of that the string theorists have kind of react react to this kind of argument that i'm making but try to hold on to it <laughs> um what about experimental validation is that uh is that a fair standard to hold before a theory of everything that's trying to unify quantum mechanics and gravity? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, to be really convinced that you know that, that on some new idea about unification really works, you need some kind of uh, you need to look at the real world and see that this is telling you something something true about it. I mean, you know, either either telling you that if you do some experiment and go out and do it, you'll get some unexpected result and that's the kind of gold standard. Or it may be just that like all those numbers that are, we don't know how to explain, it, it will show you how to calculate them. I mean, it can, it can be various kinds of experimental validation, but that that's certainly ideally what you're looking for. How tough is this, do you think, for a theory of everything, not just string theory, so for something that unifies gravity and quantum mechanics? So the, the very big and the very small, is this, uh, let me ask it one way, is, uh, is it a physics problem, a math problem, or an engineering problem? My, my guess is it, it's a combination of a physics and a, and a math problem that you really need. It's, it's not really engineering. It, it, it's not like there's some kind of well-defined thing you can write down and, and we just don't have enough computer power to do the calculation. It, it, that's not the kind of problem it is at all. Um, but the question is, you know, what mathematical tools you need to properly formulate the problem is, is unclear. So one reasonable conjecture is the way, the reason that we haven't had any success yet is just that um, we're missing, either we're missing certain physical ideas or we're missing certain mathematical tools, which are some combination of them, which would, uh, which we need to kind of properly formulate the problem and see and, and, and see that it, it has a solution that looks like the real world. But those you need, uh, I, I guess you don't, but there's a sense that uh, you need both gravity, like all the laws of physics to be operating on the same level. So it's, it's an, it feels like you need an object like a black hole or something like that um, in order to make predictions about, otherwise you're always making predictions about disjoint phenomena. Or, or or can you do that as long as the theory is consistent and doesn't have special cases for each of the phenomena? Well, your your theory should I mean if your theory is going to include gravity, our current understanding of gravity is that you should have um, there should be black hole states in it. You should be able to describe black holes in this theory, and um, and just one aspect that people have concentrated a lot on is just this kind of questions about if your theory includes black holes like it's supposed to, and it includes quantum mechanics, then there's certain kind of paradoxes which come up. And so that's that's been a huge focus of kind of quantum gravity work work has been the, just those paradoxes. But. So stepping outside of string theory, uh, can you just say first at a high level, what is a theory of everything? What does a theory of everything seek to accomplish? Well, I mean, this is very much a kind of reductionist point of view in the sense that, so it's not a theory, this is not gonna explain to you you know anything it doesn't really this kind of theory theory this kind of theory of everything we're talking about doesn't ex say anything interesting particularly about like macroscopic objects about what the weather is going to be tomorrow or you know things that are happening at this scale but just what we've discovered is that as you look at um the universe it kind of you know if you kind of start break you can start breaking it apart into and you, you end up with some fairly simple pieces quanta if you like and and which are Doing, which are interacting in some fair, in some fairly simple way, and it's um, it's so. What we mean by the theory of everything is a theory that describes all all the object, all the correct objects you need to describe what's happening in the world, and describes how they're interacting with each other at a most fundamental level. How you get from that theory to 
describing some macroscopic, incredibly complicated thing is there that becomes, again, more of an engineering problem and you may need machine learning or you may you know a lot of very different things to do it. But well, I don't even think it's uh, just engineering, it's also science. It, yeah. One thing that I find um, kind of interesting talking to physicists is, is a little bit, There's a, a little bit of hubris. So some of the most brilliant people I know are physicists, both philosophy and just in, in terms of mathematics, in terms of understanding the world. But there's a kind of a, either a hubris or what would I call it? Uh, like a confidence that if we have a theory of everything, we will understand everything. Like this is the deepest thing to understand. And I would say, and like the rest is details, right? That's the, the old Rutherford thing. Uh, but to me, there's like, this is like a cake or something. There's layers to this thing and each one has a theory of everything. Yeah. Like at, at every le level from biology, like how life originates, that itself, like complex systems. Yeah. Like that in itself is like this gigantic thing that requires a theory of everything. And then there's the, in the space of humans, psychology, like intelligence, collective intelligence, the way it emerges among species, that feels like a complex system that requires its own theory of everything. On top of that is things like in the computing space, artificial intelligence systems, like that feels like it needs a theory of everything. And it's almost like um, once we solve, uh, w once we come up with a theory of everything that explains the basic laws of physics that gave us the universe, even stuff that's super complex, like uh, how like how the uh, universe might be able to originate, even explaining something that you're not a big fan of, like multiverses or stuff that we don't have any evidence of yet, yeah. still we won't be able to have a strong explanation of uh, why food tastes delicious. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, no. Anyway, I, I, yeah, I agree completely. I mean, this there is something kind of completely wrong with this terminology of theory of everything. It, it, it's not, um, it's really in some sense a very bad term, a very hubristic and bad term terminology because it's not, um, this is explaining, this is a purely kind of reductionist point of view that you're, you're trying to understand cer certain, a certain very specific kind of things, which, you know, in principle, other things, you know, emerge from, but to actually understand how anything emerges from this is it, it's ho it, it can't be understood in terms of this this underlying fundamental theory is going to be ho hopeless in terms of kind of telling you what about this um this various emergent behavior and as you go to different levels of explanation you're going to need to develop new you know different completely different ideas completely different ways of thinking and I guess there's the famous kind of um, Phil Anderson's slogan is that you know more is different. And then, yeah, so and it's just it's it's just yeah. Even even once you understand how what a couple of things, well, if you have a collection of stuff and you understand perfectly well how each thing is interacting with it, w with the others, what the whole thing is going to do is just a completely different problem. It's just not, and you need completely different ways of thinking about it. What do you think about this? Uh, I got to ask you at a few different attempts at a theory of everything, especially recently. Uh, so I've been for many years, a big fan of cellular automata of complex systems. And obviously if, uh, because of that, a fan of Stephen Wolfram's work on in that space. But he's recently been talking about a theory of everything through his physics project, essentially. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this kind of discrete theory I, of everything for like from simple rules and simple objects on hypergraphs emerges all of our reality where time and space are emergent basically everything we see around us is emergent. yeah i yeah i, I have to say unfortunately i have kind of pretty much zero sympathy for that i mean i don't um i, I spent a little time looking at it and i just don't see it doesn't seem to me to get anywhere and and it it, it really is just really really doesn't agree at all with with what, what with what I'm seeing this the kind of unification of math and physics that I'm kind of talking about around certain kinds of very deep ideas about geometry and stuff. This, if you want to believe that that, that your things are really coming out of cellular automata at the most um, fundamental level, you have to believe that everything that I've seen my whole career and and as 
as beautiful, powerful ideas that that's all just kind of a mirage, which just kind of randomly is emerging from these more basic, very, very simple-minded things. And I, you have to give me some serious evidence for that, and I'm saying nothing. So the, uh, mirage, you don't think there could be a consistency where um, things like quantum mechanics could, could emerge from much, much, much smaller, discrete like computational type systems. Well, I think from the point of view of certain mathematical point of view, quantum mechanics is already mathematically as simple as it gets. It really is a story of, about really the, the fundamental objects that you work with and when you write down a quantum theory are in some in some one point of view precisely the fundamental objects at the deepest levels of mathematics that you're working with. They're exactly the same. So and cellular automata are something completely different which don't fit into these structures. And so I just don't see why. Anyway, anyway I don't see it as a promising uh, you know, promising thing to do. And then just looking at it and seeing, does this go anywhere? Does this solve any problem that I've ever, that I didn't, does this solve any problem of any kind? I just, I just don't see it. Yeah, to me, cellular automata and these hypographs, I'm not sure solving a problem is even the standard to apply here at this moment, to me, the fascinating thing is that the question it asks have no good answers. So yeah. there's not good math explaining, forget the physics of it, math explaining the behavior of complex systems. Yeah. And that to me is both exciting and paralyzing. Like we're at the very early days of understanding, you know, how complicated and fascinating things emerge from simple rules. Yeah, you know, and I agree, I think, I think that is a, a truly great problem, and depending where it goes, it may be, um, you know, it, it it may start to develop some kind of connections to the the things that I've kind of found more fruitful and hard to know. It just, uh, I think, a lot of that area, I, I kind of strongly feel I best not say too much about it because I, I just I don't know too much about it. And uh, I mean, again, we're back to this original problem that you know your time in life is. Uh, is limited. You have to figure out what you're going to spend your time thinking about, and that that's something I just never seen enough to convince me to spend more time thinking about. Well, also timing. It's not just that our time is limited, but yeah. uh, the timing of the kind of things you think about. There, there's some aspect to cellular automata, these kinds of objects that it feels like we're very many years away from having big breakthroughs on. Yeah. And so it's like you have to pick the problems that are solvable today. In fact, my intuition again, not perhaps biased, is it feels like the kind of systems that, complex systems that cellular automata are would not be solved by human brains. Yeah. It feels like, well, like, it feels like something post-human that will solve that problem, <laughs> or like <laughs> significantly yeah. enhanced humans, meaning like using computational tools, very powerful computational tools to us, to, to, to crack these problems open. Um, that's that's if our approach to science, our ability to understand science, our, our ability to understand physics will become more and more computational, or there'll be a whole field that's computational in nature, which currently is not the case. Like currently, computation is the thing that sort of assists us in um, understanding science the way we've been doing it all along. But if there's a whole new, I mean, that war from new kind of science, right? It's <laughs> a little bit dramatic, but you know, <laughs> This, if computers could do science on their own, computational systems, perhaps um, that's the way they would do the science. They would try to understand the cellular automata. And that feels like we're decades away. So yeah. uh, perhaps it'll crack open some interesting facets of this physics problem, but it's it's very far away. So timing uh, is everything. That, 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 that's perfectly possible, yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you then in the space of geometry, I don't know how well you know Eric Weinstein. Oh, quite well, yeah. What are your thoughts about his geometric unity and the space of ideas that he's playing with on um, in his proposal for a theory of everything? Well, I, I think he, that he has, he, he fundamentally has, I think, the same problems that everybody has had trying to do this. And, you know, they're various, they're, they're really versions of the same problem that you try to, um, you try to get unity by put it, putting everything into some bigger structure. So he's 
has 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 some other ones that that he that are not so conventional that he's trying to work with, but um, he has the, he has the same problem that even if he can if he can get a lot farther in terms of having a, a really well defined, well understood, clear picture of this these lar- these things he's working with, they're really kind of large geometrical structures with many dimensions, many kinds, and I just don't see any way. He's going to have the same problem the string theorists have. How do you get back down to the structures of the standard model? And how do you, um, yeah, so, so I, I just, anyway, I, I, it's the same. And, the, and there's another interesting example of a sim- similar kind of thing is um, Garrett Lisey's theory of everything. Again, you know, he's there, it's a little bit more specific than Eric's. He's working with this E8, but it, um, Again, I think all these things founder at the same point that you don't, you know, you create this unity, but then you have no, you don't actually have a good idea how you're going to get back to the to the actual you know, to, to the to the objects we've seen. How are you going to you create these big symmetries? How are you going to break them? And 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 because because we don't see those symmetries in in the real world. And um, so ultimately, there would need to be a a simple process. For collapsing it to four dimensions, you'd have to explain. It. Well, yeah, in, in his, I forget in, in his case, but it, it's not just four dimensions. It's also these um, these structures you see in the standard model. There's a you know there's certain very small dimensional groups of symmetries, so called U one, SU two, and SU three. And the problem with and this has been the problem since the beginning. Almost immediately after 1973, about a year later, two years later, people started talking about grand unified theories. So you take the U1, the SU2, and the SU3, and you put them in together into this bigger structure called the SU5 or SO10. But then you're stuck with this problem that, wait a minute, now how, why does the world not look, why do I not see the, the, these SU5 symmetries in the world? I only see these. And so, and and, and I think, you know, th- those ideas, the kind of thing that, that, that Eric and also in Garrett and lots of people have tried to do, they all kind of founder in that same they, they, in, in that same way that they don't have they don't have a good answer to that. Are there lessons, ideas to be learned from theories like that, from Gary Lisi's, from Eric's? Um, I don't know. It depends. I have to confess, I haven't looked that closely at a, at a, at at Eric's. I mean, he explained to this to me uh, personally a, a few times, and I've looked a bit at his paper. But it's um uh, again, we're, we're we're back to the problem of a limited amount of time in life. And, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting effect, right? Why don't more physicists look at it? There, I mean, I, I'm I'm in this position that somehow, you know, uh, I've I've uh, people write me emails for whatever reason, <laughs> and I work in the space of AI, and this, so there's a lot of people. Perhaps AI is even way more accessible than physics in a certain sense. And so a lot of people write to me with different theories about what they have for how to create uh, general intelligence. And it's, again, a little bit of an excuse I say to myself, like, well, I only have a limited amount of time, so that's why I'm not investigating it. But I wonder if um, there's ideas out there that are still powerful, that are still fascinating, and that I'm missing because I'm because I'm dismissing them because they're uh, outside of the sort of the usual process of uh, academic research. Yeah, well, I mean, I have the, the same thing pretty much every day in my email, there's a, somebody's got a theory of everything about why all of what physicists are doing. I, I, perhaps the most disturbing thing I should say about my uh, critique, being a critic of string theory is, is that when you realize who your fans are, um, that they, <laughs> every day I hear from somebody who says, oh, well, since you don't like string theory, you must, of course, agree with me that this is the right way to think about everything. Right. And, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> and, you know, most of these are, you know, you quickly can see this is person doesn't much, know very much and doesn't know what they're doing. You know, but there's a whole continuum to, you know, people who are quite serious physicists and mathematicians who are making a fairly serious attempt to try to to do something and like 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 Garrett and uh, and Eric and then then your your problem is you know you spent you you do want to try to spend more time looking at it and trying to figure out what they're really doing and but then at some point you just realize wait a minute you know to, for me to really really understand exactly what's going on here would just 
take time I just don't have. Yeah, it takes a long time, which is the nice thing about AI, yeah. is uh, unlike the kind of physics we're talking about, if your idea is good, that should quite naturally lead to you being able to build a system that's intelligent. So you don't need to get approval from say, somebody that's saying you have a good idea here. You can just utilize that idea and engineer a system. Engineer, like naturally yeah. leads to engineering. With physics here, if you have a, a perfect theory that explains everything, that still doesn't obviously lead one to, um, to, to scientific experiments that can validate that theory and two to like uh, trinkets you can build and sell right, right, yeah, in, yeah, at, yeah. at a store yeah, for $5. Yeah, you can't make money off of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that makes it much, much more challenging. Yeah. Um, well, let me also ask you about something that you found, especially recently appealing, which is Roger Penrose's twister theory. Um, what is it? What kind of questions might it allow us to answer? What will the answers look like? It's only in the last couple of years that I really, really kind of come to really, I think, to appreciate it and to see how to really, what I, I believe, to see how to really do something with it. And I've gotten very excited about that the last year or two. I mean, one way of saying one idea of twister theory is that what it's, it, it's, it's a different way of thinking about what space and time are and about what points in space and time are, and f but but which only which is very interesting that it only really works in four dimensions. So four dimensions behaves very very specially, unlike other dimensions. And in four dimensions, there's certain there is a way of thinking about space and time geometry where you know as well as just thinking about points in space and time, you can also um, th think about different objects, the so-called twisters. And and then when when you do that, you you end up with a um kind of a really interesting insight that the um that you can formulate a theory and you can formulate a very take a standard the theory that we formulate in terms of points of space and time and you can reformulate it in this twister language and in this twister language it's be um the, f the fundamental objects are actually are more kind of the are, are actually spheres in some sense kind of the light cone so maybe one way to say it which which actually i, I think is is really is, is quite amazing is if you ask yourself, you know, what do we know about, about the world? We have this idea that the world out there is this, all these different points and these points of time. Well, that's kind of a derived quantity. What we really, really know about the world is when we, we open our eyes, what do you see? You, you see a sphere and you, and that what you're looking at is you're looking at the, you know, a, a sphere is worth of light rays coming into your, into your eyes. And what Penrose says is that, well, what, what a point in spacetime is is that sphere, that sphere of all the light rays coming in, and and he says, and you should formulate your um instead of thinking about points, you should think about the space of those spheres, if you like, and formulate the degrees of freedom as physics as living on those spheres, living on so you're kind of you're kind of living on your degrees of freedom are living on light rays, not on points, and it's a very different way of thinking about um about about physics and you know he and others working with him developed a you know a beautiful mathematical this beautiful mathematical formalism and a way to go back from forth between our kind of some aspects of our standard way we write these things down and work in the so-called twister space and you know they certain things worked out very well but they ended up you know i think kind of stuck by the 80s or 90s that they weren't <laughs> a little bit like string theory that they they um by using these ideas about twisters, they could develop them in different directions and find all sorts of other interesting things. But they were they were getting they weren't finding any way of doing that that brought them back to kind of new insights into physics. And um, my own, I mean, what's kind of gotten me excited really is is what I think I have an an idea about that I think does actually does actually work that, that goes more in that direction. And um, I can can go on about that endlessly or talk a little bit about it. But that's the um, I think that, that that's the the one kind of easy to explain insight about twister theory. There are some more technical ones. I should I mean I think it's also very conv convincing what it tells you about spinners, for instance. But that's a more technical. Well, first let's like linger on the spheres and the light cones. You're, you're saying twister theory allows you to make that the fundamental object with which you're operating. Yeah. But how that? I mean, first of all, like philosophically, that's weird. And beautiful, 
maybe because it maps, it feels like it moves us so much closer to the way human brains perceive reality. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like um, it, <laughs> our perception is like the the content of our perception is the fundamental object of reality. That's yeah. very appealing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it mathematically powerful? Is there something you can say? Can you say a little bit more about what the heck that even means? Uh, for because you, you, it's much easier to think about mathematically like a point in space time. Like, what does it mean to be operating on the light cone? It uses a kind of mathematics that's relative. That you know, what was kind of goes back to the nineteenth century among mathematicians. It's not um. Anyway, it, it's a bit of a long story, but the one problem is that you have to start. It's crucial that you think in terms of complex numbers and not just real numbers. And this, for most people, that makes it harder to, for mathematicians, that's fine. We love doing that. But for m most people, that makes it harder to think about. But um, I, I, th I think perhaps the most, the way that there is a, a, a something you can say very specifically about it, you know, in terms of spinners, which I don't know if you want to, I think at some point yeah. you want to talk. So maybe well, you can, what are spinners? Let's start with spinners. Because I, th I think that if we can introduce that, then I can By the way, say, Twister is spelled with an O, <laughs> and spinner is spelled with an O as well. Yes. Okay. So, in one, case you want to Google it and look it up, there's very nice Wikipedia pages as a starting point. I don't know what is a good starting point for Twister theory. <laughs> uh, um, well, what, one thing you say about Penrose, I mean, Penrose is actually a very good writer and also a very good draftsman. He's a drafts. He, he, to the extent this is visualizable, he actually has done some very nice drawings. So, I mean, almost any kind of expository thing you can find him writing is is a very good a good place to start. He's a he's a remarkable person. But the um so spinners are something that independently came out of mathematics and out of physics. And um to say where they came out of physics, I, I mean what people realized when they started looking at elementary particles like electrons or whatever, that there there seemed to be there seemed to be some kind of doubling of the degrees of freedom going on if you counted what was there in some sense in the way you would expect it. And when you started doing quantum mechanics and started looking at elementary particles, there were seen to be two degrees of freedom. They're not one. And one way of seeing it was that if you um, if you put your electron in a strong magnetic field and ask, and ask what was the energy of it, instead of it having one energy, it would have two energies. There'd be two energy levels. And, and as you increase magnetic field, the splitting would increase. So, Physicists kind of realized that, wait a minute, so in, we thought when we were doing first started doing quantum mechanics that the way to describe particles was in terms of wave functions, and these wave functions were complex to complex values. Well, if we actually look at particles, that, that's not right. They're, they're, they're pairs of complex numbers. They're pairs of complex numbers. So, you know, why, so one of the kind of fundamental, from the physics point of view, the fundamental question is, why are all our kind of fundamental particles Described by pairs of complex numbers, just weird. And then, but if you go, and then, then you can ask, you know, well, what happens if you like take an electron and rotate it? So how how do things move in this this pair of complex numbers? Well, now if you go back to mathematics, what had been been understood in mathematics, you know, some years earlier, not that many years earlier, was that if you um, if you ask very very generally, think about geometry of three dimensions. And ask, and if you think about things that are happening in three dimensions in the standard way, everything, the standard way of doing geometry, everything is about vectors, right? So if, you've, if you've taken any mathematics classes, you probably see vectors at some point. They're just triplets of numbers tell you what a direction is or how, how far you're going in three dimensional space. And most of a, everything we teach in most standard courses in mathematics is about vectors and things you build out of vectors. So you express everything about geometry in terms of vectors or how they're changing or how you put two of them together and get planes and whatever. But what had been realized that early on is that if you ask very, very generally, what are the, if you have, what are the things that can, that you can kind of consistently think about rotating? And um, and you can, so you, you ask a technical question, what are the representations of the rotation group? Well, you, you find that there, one answer is they're vectors and everything you build out of vectors. But then you, people found, but wait a minute, there's also these other things which you can't build out of vectors. 
but what which you can consistently rotate, and they're they're described by pairs of complex numbers, by two complex numbers, and they're 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 the spinners also, and to make a lot and and to make and and you can think of spinners in some sense as more fundamental than vectors because you can build vectors out of spinners. You can take two spinners and make a vector, but you can't you can't if, if you only have vectors, you can't get spinners. So there, in some sense, at, there's some kind of level of lower level of geometry beyond what we thought it was, which was kind of spinner geometry. And this is something which, even to this day, when we teach graduate courses in geometry, we mostly don't talk about this because it's a bit it's a bit hard hard to hard to do correctly. If if, if you start if you start with your whole setup is in terms of vectors, getting describing things in terms of spinners is a whole different ball game. But um. The but so but any, anyway, it was just this, this amazing fact that this this kind of more fundamental piece of geometry, of spinners, and what we were actually seeing, if you look at electron, are one and the same. So it's a, it's, I think it's kind of a, kind of a mind blowing thing, but it it's very uh, un counterintuitive. What are some weird properties of spinners that that are counterintuitive? That there are some things that they do. For instance, if you rotate a spinner around. 360 degrees, it doesn't come back to where it's, it, it becomes minus what it was before. So it's, anyway, so so the way rotations work, there's a kind of a funny sign you have to keep track of in some sense. Um, so they're kind of too valued in a, another weird way. But there's a, but, but the fundamental problem is that it, it's just not, if you're used to visualizing vectors, you just, there's nothing you can do visualizing in terms of vectors that will ever give you a spinner. It just is not gonna ever work. As you were saying that, I was visualizing a vector walking along a Mobius strip, yeah. and it ends up being upside down. Um, yeah. But you're saying that doesn't really capture. Yeah, right. So, I mean, what what really captures it? The pro the problem is that it, it's really the simplest way to describe it is in terms of two complex numbers. Mm -hmm. And our, your problem with two complex numbers is that's four real numbers. So, your spinner kind of lies in a four dimensional space. So you that makes it hard to visualize. And it's crucial that it's not just any four dimensions, it's just that it's actually complex numbers. You're really gonna use the fact that these are the complex numbers. So it, it, um, <laughs> it's very hard to visualize. But, but to get back to what I think is mind blowing about twisters is that the, another way of saying this, this idea about talking about spheres, another way of saying the fundamental idea of twister theory is in some sense, the fundamental idea of twister theory is that a point is a two is a two is a two complex dimensional space. So that every and that it lives inside the space that it lies inside is twister space. So in the simplest case, it's four twister space is four dimensional, and a point in space time is a two complex dimensional um, subspace of the four, of the of all the four complex dimensions. Mm -hmm. And as you move around in space time, you're just moving. Your planes are just moving around. Okay. And that, and but but then the so it's a, it's a plane in a four dimensional space. It's a it, yeah a plane Com it, complex complex uh, plane. So it's two complex two dimensions complex. in four complex. Got it. But then, to me, the mind blowing thing about this is this then kind of tautologically answers the question: Is what is a spinner? Well, <laughs> a spinner is a point. <laughs> I mean, the space of spinners at a point is the point in twister theory. The points are the complex two planes, and and you want me to, and you're asking what a spinner is. Well, a spinner, in the space of spinners is that two plane. So it, it's you know just your whole definition of what a point in space time was just told you what a spinner was. It's they're they're just it's the same thing. Yeah, but we're trying to project that into a three dimensional space and trying to intuit, but yeah, you can't. Yeah so, yeah, so the intuition becomes very difficult. But um, but from if you don't you not using twister theory. You have to kind of go through a certain fairly complicated rig rigmarole to even describe spinners, to describe electrons. Whereas using twister theory, it's just completely tautological. They're just what you want <laughs> to describe the electron is fundamentally the way that you're describing the point in space time already. It's just there. So, do you have a hope? You you mentioned that you've been uh, you found it appealing recently. Is it just because of certain aspects of its mathematical beauty, or do you actually have a hope that this might lead to a theory of everything? Yeah, I mean, I certainly do have such a hope because what what I've found, I think the thing which which I've done, which I, I don't think, as far as I can tell, no one had really looked at 
from this point of view before is has to do with it, this question of how do how do you treat time in your in your quantum theory and um so there there's another long story about how we do quantum theories and about how we treat time in quantum theories which um is, is a long story but to me, the, the short version of it is that what what people have found when you try and write down a quantum theory that it's often it's often a good idea to take your time coordinate, whatever you're using to your time coordinate, and then multiply it by the square root of minus one and to make it purely imaginary. And so you, all these formulas which you have um, in your standard theory, if you do that to those, I mean, those, those formulas have some very strange strange behavior and they're kind of singular. If, if you ask even some simple questions, you have to very take very delicate singular limits in order to get the correct answer. And you have to take them from the right direction, otherwise it doesn't work. Whereas if you just take time, and, and if you just put a factor of square root of minus one wherever you see the time coordinate, you end up with a much simpler formulas which are much better behaved mathematically. And what I, what I hadn't really appreciated until fairly recently is also how dramatically that changes the whole structure of the theory. You end up with a consistent way of talking about these quantum theories, but it has very some very different flavor and very different aspects that I hadn't really appreciated. And in particular, the way the way symmetries act on it is 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 not at all what I, I originally had expected. And so that's the the new thing that I've where I think I think gives you something is to um to do this move, which people often think of as just kind of a kind of a mathematical trick that you're doing to make some formulas work out nicely, but to take that mathematical trick as really fundamental. And um, turns out in twister theory allows you to simultaneously talk about your usual time and the time times the square root of minus one. They both fit. They both fit very nicely into twister theory, and um, you end up with a some structures which which look a lot like the standard models. Well, let me ask you about some Nobel prizes. Okay. Do you think there will be? Uh, uh, there was a bet between uh, Michio Kaku and. Somebody else that, uh, about John, John Horgan. Yeah. John Horgan yeah. about. Uh, uh, by the way, it made me discover a cool website, longbets.com or .org. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's cool that you can make a bet with people, uh, and then check in twenty years later. That's uh, I really love it. There's a lot of interesting bets on there. Yeah, uh, I would love to participate. But it's interesting to see. You know, time flies. Yeah. You, and you make a bet about what's going to happen in twenty years. You don't realize twenty years just goes like this. Yeah, yeah, and then and then you get to face, oh, and you get to wonder, like, what was that person? What was I thinking? That person twenty years ago is almost like a different person. What was I thinking back then to think that is interesting? But so let me ask you this <laughs> on record: <laughs> uh, you know, uh, twenty years from now, or some number of years from now, do you think there will be a Nobel Prize given for something directly connected to a? First, broadly, theory of everything. And second, of course, uh, one of the possibilities, one of them, uh, string theory. Um, <laughs> string theory is definitely not that uh, things have gone. Yeah. So if, I, and, if you were giving financial advice, you would say not to bet on that. No, do not bet on that. And, and even, uh, I actually suspect if you ask string theorists that question, you, these days, you, you're, you're not going to get few of them saying, I mean, if you'd asked them that question 20 years ago, again, when Kaku was making this bet or whatever, I think some, some of them would have taken you up on it. But, um, and certainly back in 1984, a bunch of them would have said, oh, sure, yeah. But now I, I get the impression that they've, they've, even they realize that things are not looking good for that particular idea. Again, it depends what you mean by string theory, whether maybe the term will evolve to mean something else, which which will work out. But I don't, yeah, I don't think that's not gonna like it to work out. Whether um, something else, I mean, I, I still think it's relatively unlikely that you'll have any really successful theory of everything. And, and, and the, the main problem is, is just the, um, it's become so difficult to do experiments at higher energy that we've really lost this ability to kind of get Unexpected input from from experiment, and and you can you know while it's maybe hard to figure out what people's thinking is going to be twenty years from now, looking at um, 
you know, high energy particle, high energy colliders and their technology, it's actually pretty easy to make a, a pretty accurate guess what it's going to look, what, what you're going to be doing 20 years from now. And, um, I think actually, I, I would actually claim that it's pretty clear what, where you're going to be 20 years from now. And what it's going to be is you're going to have the, um, you're going to have the, the LHC, you're going to have a lot more data an order of magnitude or more, or more data from the LHC, but at the same energy, you're not going to, you're not going to see a, a higher energy, um, accelerator operating successfully in the, um, in the next 20 years. And like, um, maybe machine learning or great sort of data science methodologies that process that data will not reveal any major uh, like shifts in our understanding of the underlying physics, you think? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think you know, that, that that field, uh, my understanding is that you know, they, they're they starting to make a, a great use of those techniques, but, but it seems to look like it, 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 will, it will help them solve certain technical problems and be able to do things somewhat better, but not completely change the way they're looking at things. What do you think about the potential quantum computers simulating quantum mechanical systems and through that sneak up to sort of simu through simulation, sneak up to a deep understanding of um, the fundamental physics? The problem there is, is that, that that's promising more for this, um, for, uh, you know, for Phil Anderson's problem that, you know, if, if you want to, there, there's lots and lots of, if you know, you, you take, you start putting together uh, lots and lots of things, and we think we know that are pair by pair interactions. But what this thing is going to do, we don't have any good calculational techniques. You know, quantum computers may may very well give you those, and so they may. What we think of as kind of strong coupling behavior, we have no good way to calculate. You know, even though we can write down the theory, we don't know how to calculate anything with any accuracy in it. The um, quantum computers may solve that problem, but the problem is that they—I don't—I don't think that they're going to solve the problem that they help you with the problem of not having the of, of knowing what the right underlying theory is. As somebody uh, who likes experimental validation, let me ask you the perhaps ridiculous sounding, but I don't think it's actually a ridiculous question of: Do you think we live in a simulation? <laughs> do you find that thought experiment at all useful or interesting? Not, not really. Not not really. I don't. Uh, it, it just doesn't. Uh, yeah. And, and anyway, to, to, to me, it, it doesn't actually lead to any kind of interesting, lead anywhere interesting. And yeah, to to me, so maybe I'll I'll throw a wrench into your thing. Uh, to me, it's super interesting from an engineering perspective. So if you look yeah. at virtual reality systems, the the actual question is, how much computation and how difficult is it? to construct a world that, uh, like there are several levels here. One is you won't know the different, our human perception systems, and maybe even the tools of physics won't know the difference between the simulated world and the real world. Um, that's sort of more of a physics question. The, the most interesting question to me has more to do with why food tastes delicious, which is create how difficult and how much computation is required to construct a simulation where you kind of know it's a simulation at first, but you want to stay there anyway. And over <laughs> time, you don't even remember. Yeah. Well, yeah, anyway, I agree. These are kind of fascinating questions and they may be very, very relevant to our future as a species, but um, yeah, they're just very far from anything I... But so from a physics perspective, it's not useful to you to think, taking a computational perspective to our universe, thinking of it as an information processing system, and then think of it as doing computation, and then you think about the resources required to do that kind of computation and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You could just look at the basic physics and who cares what the, the computer it's running on is. Yeah, it, it just, I mean, the kinds of, I mean, I'm willing to agree that you can get into interesting kinds of questions going down that road, but they're, they're just so different from anything from what I found interesting that I just, again, I just have to kind of go back to life is too short and I hope, I'm very glad other people are thinking about this, but <laughs> yeah, I just don't see any, any, anything I can do with it. What about uh, space itself? So I have to ask you about aliens. <laughs> again, something, uh, since you emphasize evidence, um, do you think there is, how many, do you think there are and how many intelligent alien civilizations are out there. <laughs> yeah, 
I have, I have no idea, but I've certainly, as far as I know, unless the government's covering it up or something, we haven't heard from, uh, we don't have any evidence for such things yet, but there's no, there seems to be no, there's no particular obstruction why there shouldn't be, so. I mean, do you, <laughs> you work on some fundamental questions about the physics of reality when you look up to the stars, do you think about whether somebody's looking back at us? Yes, yeah, well, actually, I originally got interested in physics. I actually started out as a kid interested in astronomy, exactly that, and a telescope and whatever that, and certainly read a lot of science fiction and thought about that. I, I find over the years, I find myself kind of less, anyway, less and less interested in that, well, just because I don't, I kind of don't really know what to do with them. Um, I've also kind of, kind of at some point kind of stopped reading science fiction that much, kind of feeling that there's just too, that the actual science I was kind of learning about was perfectly kind of weird and fascinating and unusual enough that, and better than any of the stuff that in Isaac Asimov, so why should I? <laughs> yeah, and you can mess with the science much more than the, the distant science fiction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the one that's exists in our imagination or the one that exists out there in, in, among the stars. Yeah. Well, you mentioned science fiction. You've written quite a few book reviews. I gotta ask you about some books, perhaps, if you don't mind. Um, is is there one or two books that you would recommend to others? And maybe if you can, what ideas you drew from them? Either negative recommendation or positive <laughs> recommendation. <laughs> well, Do I, not read this book for sure. Well, I must say, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, yeah, well, you can go to my website, and there's a you can click on book reviews, and you can see I've written, reviewed a lot of a lot of. I mean, uh, as you can tell from my views about string theory, I, I'm not a fan of a, a lot of the kind of popular books about oh, isn't string theory great? And about yes, yeah, so I'm not a fan of a, a lot of things of that kind. Can I ask you a quick question on yeah. this? A small tangent. Are you a fan? Okay, can you explore the pros and cons of, forget string theory, sort of science communication, sort of cosmos style communication of concepts to people that are outside of physics, outside of mathematics, outside of even the sciences, and helping people to sort of dream and fill them with awe about the full range of mysteries in our universe? That's a complicated issue. You know, I think. You know, I certainly go back and go back to, to like what inspired me, and um, maybe to connect it uh, to connect it a little bit to this question about books. I mean, cer certainly one the books that some books that I remember reading when I was a kid were about the early history of quantum mechanics, like Heisenberg's books that he wrote about you know kind of looking back at telling the history of what happened when he developed quantum mechanics. It's just kind of a totally fascinating, romantic, great story, and uh, those were very inspirational to me. And um, I would think maybe that other people might also. Also find them that, but the um, the, and that's that's almost like the human story of the development of the ideas. Yeah, the human story, but uh, yeah, just also how you know they they are these very very weird ideas that didn't seem to make sense. That how they were struggling with them and how you know they actually. Anyway, it's it's it's, it's I think it's a, the, the period of physics kind of beginning, you know, nineteen oh five with Planck and Einstein and ending up with the war when <laughs> these things are get used to you know make. Massively destructive weapons. It's, it's just the truly amazing. And so many, so theory. many new ideas. Let me on another a tangent on top of a tangent on top of a tangent. Ask if we didn't have Einstein. So how does science progress? Is it the lone geniuses, or is it uh, some kind of weird network of ideas swimming in the air and, and just kind of the the geniuses pop up to catch them and others would anyway? Without Einstein, would we have uh, special relativity, general relativity. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting case-to-case uh, -case base. I mean, I mean, special special relativity. I, th I think we would have had. I mean, there are other people. Anyway, you could even argue that it, it was already there in some form in some ways. But I think special relativity you would have had without Einstein fairly, fairly quickly. General relativity, that was a much much harder thing to do, and. Um, Required a much more effort, much more sophisticated. That you, I think he would have had sooner or later, but it would have taken taken quite a bit longer. Other that, thing that took a bunch of years to validate scientifically the general relativity. 
But even for Einstein, from you know the point where he had kind of a general idea of what he was trying to do to the point where he actually had a well-defined theory that you could actually compare to the real world, that was, you know, I don't forget the number, but of the order of magnitude, 10 years of very serious work. And um, if he hadn't been an, around to do that, it would have taken a while before anyone else got around to it. On the other hand, there are things like with quantum mechanics, you have, um, you know, Heisenberg and um, Schrodinger came up with two, which ultimately equivalent, but two different approaches to it, you know, within months of each other. And, you know, so if Heisenberg hadn't been there, he already would have had Schrodinger or whatever. And if neither of them had been there, it would have been somebody else a few months later. So there are times when the, um, you know, just the, a lot, often it's the combination of, of the right ideas are in place and the right experimental data is in place to point in the right direction. And it's just waiting for somebody who's going to find it. Um, maybe, maybe to go back to your, uh, to your aliens, I guess the one thing I often wonder about aliens is would they have the same fundamental physics ideas as we, if we have in mathematics, would their math, you know, would they, you know, it, how, how much is this really intrinsic to our minds? If, if you start out with a different kind of mind, wouldn't you end up with a different ideas of what fundamental physics is or what, or what the structure of mathematics is? So this is why, like, yeah. if, if I was, uh, you know, I like video games. The way I would do it as a curious being, so first experiment I'd like to do is run Earth over many thousands of times and see if our particular, um, no, you know what? I wouldn't do the full evolution. I would start at Homo sapiens first and then see the evolution of Homo sapiens millions of times and see how the, the ideas of science would evolve. Like, would you yeah. get, like how would physics evolve? How would math evolve? I would particularly just be curious about the notation they come up with. Yeah. Um, every once in a while, I would like throw miracles at them to like <laughs> to, to mess with them and stuff. And, and then I would also like to run Earth from the very beginning to see if evolution would produce different kinds of brains that would then produce different kinds of mathematics and physics. And then finally, I would probably millions of times run the universe over to see what kind of um, what kind of environments and what kind of uh, life would be created to then lead to intelligent life, to then lead to um, theories of mathematics and physics and to see the full range. And like sort of uh, like uh, Darwin kind of mark, okay, it took them, uh, what is it? Uh, several hundred million years to come up with uh, calculus. <laughs> I would just like keep noting how long it took and get an average and see see which ideas are difficult, which are not, and and then and then conclusively sort of figure out if it's uh, if it's more collective intelligence or singular intelligence that's responsible for shifts and for big phase shifts and breakthroughs in science. Yeah. If I was playing a video game and ran okay. the, I got a chance to run this whole thing. Yeah, but um, we're talking about books. Before about I distract okay, so books, yeah, go back books and yeah, so and, and then yeah, so that's one thing I'd recommend is the is the books books about the from the original people, especially Heisenberg, about the how that happened. And there's also a very, very good kind of history of of the kind of what happened during this twentieth century in physics and you know, up to the time of the standard model in nineteen seventy three. It's called the um, the second creation by um Bob Kreese and uh, and Mann. That's one of the best ones I know. That's, but the the one thing that I can say is that so that book I think, forget when it was late eighties nineties. The problem is that there just hasn't been much that's actually worked out since then. So most of the books that are kind of trying to tell you about all the glorious things that have happened since nineteen seventy three are, they're mostly telling you about how glorious things are, which actually don't really work, and it, it's really. The argument people sometimes make in term in, in favor of these books as well, oh, you know, they're they're really great because you want to do something that will get kids excited, and then you know, so they're getting excited about things, something that's not really quite working. It's doesn't really matter. The main thing is get them excited. The, the other argument is, you know, wait a minute. When if you're getting people excited about ideas that are wrong, you're really kind of you're actually kind of discrediting the whole scientific enterprise in a, in a not really good way. So there's these problems. So my. Uh, a general feeling about expository stuff is, yeah, it's to the extent you can do it kind of honestly and 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 well, that's great. There are a lot of people doing that now, but to the extent that you're just trying to get people, 
excited and enthusiastic by kind of telling them stuff which isn't really true. This is really, you really shouldn't be doing that. You obviously have a much better intuition about physics. I, I tend to, um, in the space of AI, for example, you could you could use certain kinds of language, like calling things um, intelligent that uh, could rub people the wrong way. But I, I never had a problem with that kind of thing. You know, saying that a program can learn its way without any human supervision, as Alpha Zero does to play chess. To me, that. Um, may not be intelligence, but it sure the, as heck seems like a few steps down the path towards intelligence. Yeah. And, and so like, I think that's a very peculiar uh, property of systems that can be engineered. So even if the idea is fuzzy, even if you're not really sure what intelligence is, or um, like if you don't have a deep fundamental understanding or even a model what intelligence is, if you build a system that sure as heck is impressive, and uh, showing some of the signs yeah. of what previously thought impossible for a non-intelligent uh, system, then that's impressive and that's inspiring and yeah. that's okay to celebrate. In physics, because you're not engineering anything, you're just now swimming in the space it, directly when you do the theoretical physics, that it could be more dangerous. You could be out too far away from shore. Yeah, well the problem, I think if physics is it in a. I think it's actually hard for people even to believe or really understand how that this particular kind of physics has gotten itself into a really unusual and strange and historically unusual state, which is not really. I mean, I, I spent half my life among mathematicians and half among physicists, and you know, mathematics is kind of doing fine. People are making progress, and it has all the usual problems, but also, so you could have a. But but you just, I just I don't know I've never seen anything at all happening in mathematics like what's happened in this specific area in physics. It's just the kind of sociology of this the way this field works, banging up against this hard a problem without anything from experiment to help it. It's really it's led to some some really kind of problematic things, and those. So it's it's one thing to kind of you know, oversimplify or to slightly misrepresent, to try to explain things in a way that's not quite right. But it's another thing to start promoting to people as a success as ideas which which really completely failed. And um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I have kind of a very, very specific, you know, if you start to have people, <laughs> won't name any names, for instance, coming on certain podcasts like yours, telling the world, you know, this is a huge success and this is really wonderful. And it's just not true. And and this is this this is really problematic, and and it carries a serious danger of, um, you know, once when people realize that this is what's going on, you know, they, you know, the, the loss of credibility of of science is is a real real problem for our society, and and you don't want you don't want people to have an all too good reason to to, to think that what they're being what they're being told by kind of some of the best. To, Institutions in our country and our authority is, is 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 not true. You know, is, is is not true. It's a problem. That's that's obviously a characteristic of not just physics. It's uh, it's sociology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, I mean, obviously, in the space of politics, it's that's the history of politics. Is uh, you, um, you you sell ideas to, to people even when you don't have any proof that those ideas actually work. Yeah. You speak as if they've have worked and that, that seems to be the case uh, throughout history. Um, and just like you said, it's human beings running up against a really hard problem. I'm not sure if this is like a particular uh, like trajectory through the progress of physics that we're dealing with now, or is it just a natural progress of science? You run up against a really difficult stage of a field and uh, different people that behave differently in the face of that. Yeah. Uh, some sell books and sort of uh, tell narratives that are beautiful and so on. They're not necessarily grounded in um, solutions that have proven themselves. Others kind of uh, put their head down quietly, keep doing the work. Others sort of pivot to different fields and yeah. that's kind of like, yeah, ants scattering and, and then you have Feels like machine learning, which there's a, there's a few folks mostly scattered away from machine learning, 
in the in the nineties in the winter of AI AI winter as they mm -hmm. call it. But a few people kept their head down, and now they're called the fathers of deep learning. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and and they didn't think of it that way. Um, and in fact, if, if there's another AI winter, they'll just probably keep working on it anyway. Sort of like uh, loyal ants <laughs> to a particular. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 interesting. But you're sort of saying that um, we should be careful over hyping things that have not proven themselves, because people will lose trust in the scientific process. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, there's been other ways in which people have lost trust in the scientific process. And that ultimately yeah. has to do actually with all the same kind of behavior as you're highlighting, which is not being honest and transparent about the flaws of mistakes of the past. Yeah, I mean, that's always a problem, but um, this particular field is kind of fun. It, 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 it's, a, it's, it's always a strange one. I mean, I think it, in the sense that there's a lot of public fascination with it that it seems to speak to kind of our deepest questions about, you know, what is this physical reality? Where do we come from? And what and these kind of deep issues. So there's there is this unusual fascination with it. Mathematics is versus very different. Nobody nobody's that interested in mathematics. Nobody really kind of expects to learn really great deep things about the world from mathematics that much. They don't ask mathematicians that. So 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 it, it's a very unusual. It, it, it draws this kind of unusual amount of attention. And it, it really is historically in a, in a really unusual state. It's kind of, it, it's gotten itself way kind of down a, a down a blind alley in, in, a, in, a, in a way which it, it, it's hard to find other historical parallels to. But sort of to push back a little bit, there's power to inspiring people. And yeah. if I just empirically look, physicists are really good at um, combining science and philosophy and communicating it. Like there's something about physics often that forces you to build a strong intuition about the way reality works, yeah. right? And that allows you to think through sort of and communicate about all kinds of questions. Like if you, see, if you see physicists, it's always fascinating to take on problems that have nothing to do with their particular discipline. Yeah. They think interest, in interesting ways and they're able to communicate their thinking in interesting ways. Yeah. And so in some sense, they have a responsibility not just to do science, but to inspire. And not responsibility, but the opportunity, and thereby yeah. I would say a little bit of a responsibility. Yeah, yeah, in some sense, but um, I don't know, anyway, it, it, it's hard to say, because different, um, there, there's many, many people doing this kind of thing with different degrees of of, of success and whatever. I, I guess one thing, um, but but I mean my what's kind of front and center for me is kind of a more parochial interest is just kind of what what damage do you do to the subject itself ignoring okay, mis mis misrepresenting you know what what a high school students think about string theory and not that in, doesn't matter much but but what the smartest undergraduates or the smartest graduate students in the world think about it and what paths you're leading them down and what story you're telling them and what textbooks you're making them read and what they're hearing. And um, and so a lot of what's motivated me is more to try to speak to a kind of a specific population of, of people to make sure that, look, you know, people, it doesn't matter so much what the rest, of, what the average person on the street thinks about string theory, but you know, what, 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 what the best students at Columbia or Harvard or Princeton or whatever, who are, who, who really want to change work in this field and want to work that way, what, what they know about it, what they think about it, and that they not be go into the field being misled and believing that a certain story, this is where this is all going, this is what I got to do, um, is, is, is that's important to me. Well, in general, for graduate students, for uh, people who seek to be experts in the field, diversity of ideas is really powerful. And yeah. is getting into this local pocket of ideas that people hold on to for several decades is not good. No yeah. matter what the idea, I would say no matter if the idea is right or wrong, oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. there's no such thing as right in the long term. Like it's right for now, <laughs> <laughs> until somebody builds on yeah, yeah. Uh, something much bigger on top of it. It might end up being right, but being a, a, a tiny subset of a much bigger thing. So yeah. there, you always should question sort of the uh, the ways of the past. Yeah, yeah. So so how to kind of achieve that kind of diversity of thought and how to 
within kind of the sociology of how we organize scientific research is, I know this is one thing that I think it's very interesting that uh, Sabina Hassenfelder is very, has interesting things to say about it. And I think also Lee Smolin in his book, which is also about that, I mean, very, I'm very much in agreement with them that there's, anyway, there, there's a really kind of important questions about, you know, how, 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 how research in this field is organized and how people, you know, what can you do to kind of get and get more diversity of thought and get more to, and get people thinking about, um, about a wider range of ideas. At the bottom, I think humility always helps. <laughs> well, some, but it, the problem is that it's also, it's a combination of humility to know when, when you're wrong and also, but also you have to have a, you have to have a certain ser very serious lack of humility to believe that you're going to make progress on some of these problems. I, I think you have to have like both modes and switch between them <laughs> yeah. when needed. <sighs> Let me ask you a question you're probably not going to want to answer because uh, <laughs> you're focused on the mathematics of things and mathematics can't answer the why questions. But let me ask you anyway, do you think there's meaning to this whole thing? What do you think is the meaning of life? Why are we here? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking about this. So the um, it did occur to me. What one interesting thing about that question is that you don't. Yes, you know, so I have this life in mathematics and this life in physics, and and I see some of my physicist colleagues. You know, kind of seem to be people are often asking them what's the meaning of life, and they're writing books about the meaning of life and teaching courses about the meaning of life, and. But then I realized that no one ever asked my mathematician colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever asked mathematicians. Yeah, that's funny. So, I, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, everybody just kind of assumes, okay, well, you people are studying about that. Whatever you're doing, it's maybe very interesting, but it's clearly not going to tell me anything useful about the meaning of my life. And I'm, I'm afraid a, a lot of my point of view is that if people realized how little difference there was between what the mathematicians are doing and what a lot of these theoretical physicists are doing, they would, they might understand that it's a bit misguided uh, to look for deep insight into the meaning of life from from, <laughs> from many theoretical physicists. It's not a they you know they're they're people and they have they may have interesting things to say about this. You're right. They have they know a lot about physical reality and about about in some sense about metaphysics about what is 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 real of this kind. But um, you're also <laughs> To my mind, I think you're also making a bit of a mistake that you're you're looking to. Uh, I mean, I, I'm very very aware that you know I've I've led a very pleasant and fairly privileged existence of a fairly without many challenges of different kinds and of, and of a, a certain kind and and um, I, I'm I'm really not in no way the kind of person that a lot of people who are looking for to, to try to understand in some sense the meaning of life in the sense of the challenges that they're facing in life. Uh, I can't really. I'm, the, I'm really the wrong person for you to be asking about this. Well, if struggle is somehow a thing that's core to meaning, yeah. perhaps mathematicians are just quietly the ones who are <laughs> most equipped to answer that question. If in fact, the creation or at least experiencing beauty is, uh, is, is, is at the core of the meaning of life, because it seems like mathematics is the methodology by which you can most purely explore beautiful things, right? Yeah. yeah. So in some sense, maybe we should talk to mathematicians more. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But but the uh, unfortunately, I think you know people do have a somewhat correct perception that what these people are doing every day, or whatever, is is pretty far removed from anything. Yeah, from 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 what's kind of close to to, to what I'm been, what I do every day and what my typical concerns are. So you may learn something very interesting by talking to mathematicians, but it's uh it's probably not going to be. You're probably not going to get what you were hoping. <sighs> so when you put the pen and, and paper down, and you're not thinking about physics, and you're not thinking about mathematics, and you just get to breathe in the air and look around you and realize that you're going to die one day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that? Um, your ideas will live on, but you, the human, not 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 especially much. But certainly, I've been getting getting older. I'm now sixty four years old. You start to realize, well, there's probably less ahead than there was behind, and so you start to that starts to become, you know, wait a minute, what do I think about that? Maybe I should actually 
get serious about some, getting some things done, which I, <laughs> which I may not have, which I may otherwise not have time to do, which I didn't see. And this didn't seem to be a problem when I was younger, but um, that's the main, I think the main way in which that thought occurs. But it doesn't, uh, you know, the Stoics are big on this, meditating on mortality helps you more intensely appreciate the beauty when you do experience it. I suppose that's true, but it's not, yeah, it's not, not something I've spent a lot of, <laughs> a lot of time trying, but, um, but yeah. Day to day, you just enjoy the puzzles, just, the mathematics. Just, just enjoy, yeah, our, 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 our life in general. Life is, have a perfectly pleasant life and enjoy, enjoy it and often think, wow, this is, things are, I'm really enjoying this. Things are going well. <laughs> yeah, life is pretty amazing. Yeah. I think uh, you and I are pretty lucky. We get to uh, live on this nice little earth yeah, with a nice little comfortable climate. And we get to have this nice little podcast conversation. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with me today and having this conversation. Thank you. Glad. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Peter White. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Richard Feynman. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.